You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Happy Pollinator Week, everyone. Welcome back to a new Rooted Discussion episode of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. Welcome to a, a slightly earlier than Pollinator Week, episode 58. And, slightly. Uh, and we had a, a request in our Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group to do like a check-in with some of uh, some of our past guests, we which... This was already in the works before that request. <laughs> but we have like an all-star lineup of returning guests um, to talk about pollinators. So yeah. it, it, this is like the dream team of pollinators. Not well, pollinator guests. Yes. Not yeah. real yeah. pollinators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that list. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to put together yeah, a we should do like a yeah, team. Mount Rushmore of pollinators. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the end of the episode. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. So I'm not even sure why I'm here. I feel like I like some of these discussions that I'm just getting in the way. Like we have all these great guests and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm here. Well, you, you have to provide the comedic relief and, and I don't think you keep quiet that long anyway. So, so but no, it's, you can mute my mic. Sometimes when that. we have these, these larger discussions, it is nice to kind of just sit back and listen and observe and, yeah. and take it. And then you realize, oh yeah, this is, we're, we're in charge here. We got to well, interject I, a little bit. I have been told by more than one listener that I need to let our guests talk more mm -hmm. and I should possibly talk less yeah. so maybe i can yeah. take that role today and yeah let our guests yeah and talk. why don't we start right now <laughs> with <laughs> and we'll get right into our guests um and these i think all three of your episodes were back to back to back um Ooh, i didn't even realize we that. had uh marcus gray from then audubon international and now you had a little little change uh we had uh sam drogi from uh usgs and you're still in the same spot so and that was the national b inventory and then we had kelly gill from the xerxes society who also has still with the xerxes society but had a little change there as well so i'll let you guys um update everyone where you kind of currently are and uh and what you've been doing since we last had you on about a year ago i guess wow so marcus why don't we start with you all right thanks tom thanks Fran. i appreciate you having me back on it's good to see kelly and sam here too um so i transitioned from auto international like tom said to being the executive director of Sustainable Monarch. It's a nonprofit that's working to stack ecological and economic values to encourage landowners to maintain pollinator habitat. So we're working with companies that make things out of milkweed, you know, milkweed floss or fiber out of the, the pod, um, seed oil, um, or the stalks to make clothing, lotions, you know, salves, cosmetics, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, um, and fill for clothing, bedding batting for quilts that sort of thing, to try to get people planting more habitat because they value and they're making money off of the native plants you know, without degrading them so that's that's a lot of what we've been doing and we've got a couple of events coming up with butterfly counting to um sort of like a hit-a-thon where you, you go get pledges for your kids you know mm -hmm. how many baseballs they hit or softballs they hit you know how many butterfly species can you see can you get pledges from the hardware store or your family or friends um for the either the number of individual butterflies or the number of species that you see mm -hmm. very cool very nice very cool. Very and that's cool. called the world series Butterf of yes butterfly, butterflying right? world series yep that's yeah right. i think fran and i are going to have to put together a team for that too oh, when's that great start? No, i hope you do it's it's july 17th and 18th so it's just one weekend right. um, a little later than some of the other counts that go on but i've had people tell me they want something a little later mm -hmm. in the season as well so um i just picked that date arbitrarily and we're just going to go there it just happens to be during moth week so <laughs> yeah, um gonna be, he'll be up all day <laughs> all night <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so all right sam why don't we move on to to you why don't you give a little update of uh how you've been since we last talked your i think your microphone is yeah, muted. this might be our first first muted <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah oh, sorry I, I was having some um internet instability not personal instability, but um, <laughs> no, that's the, happening on my end here. Uh, I think I think I cleared it up by just eliminating all the 500 windows that I had open. So hopefully we're going from there. Uh, I don't know uh, 
what the specific updates are, but we've been working now a lot on bumblebees and doing bumblebee surveys, crafting some new techniques for um, looking at um, populations in the areas where the endangered bumblebee is, that's Bombus aphanus or the, what is the common name, rusty belt? Um, uh, help me out on there, yeah. Kelly. Is it rusty patch bumblebee? Rusty patch. <laughs> yeah, and doing it in a non-lethal way, which we're not used to doing. And then we're also working on, um, and you guys will like this, we're looking at how to quantify what bees actually are using when they're out in the wild. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of records like this bee is sitting on that plant, particularly bumblebees and things, and that accumulates over time, but we don't have a context. So we're looking at, uh, okay, we're finding uh, bumblebees foraging on these plants, and these are the specific plants and the specific bumblebee species, but uh, now we're putting that into the context, well, what else is blooming? What's the um, um, other options that they have so that we can really nail preferences in a much more accurate way. So ultimately we'll be providing uh, nursery people and all kinds of folks um, with lists of like, these are the best bumblebee plants based on actual data wow. uh, rather than you know the kind of observations that we do. Fantastic. I'm Very looking cool. forward to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any help that we can get, the better. The yeah. Better. Yeah. So, Including a lot of rare, rare and uncommon plants that aren't really in the trade, I would say, right now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's it's funny how far along we've come. Like, we went from having none of that mm -hmm. to now actually, like, it's it's within our reach, within yeah. our sights. I'm, like, I'm excited about that. So. And uh, Kelly, why don't you give a little update of uh, of your promotion in the Xerxes side? <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I'm uh, not going anywhere, so nobody panic. Um, <laughs> and I will interject. We got or really feel scared. disappointed no, either way, however you want to feel yeah, about we, it. Um, we did panic. Yeah, we, we did got, panic. We got really scared because we saw a job posting for the like the New Jersey Regional Xerxes Society rep. I'm like, oh no, what's happening to Kelly? Yeah, I saw it on Where's she going? Uh, I was going now. Uh, she must get needs to supervise somebody. It's not yeah, yeah I, I saw it on Facebook. I'm like, it's funny, but the job posting that's or the job listing that's posted. Sounds like Kelly's job. <laughs> well, don't worry. They haven't canned me yet. So. <laughs> um, so most of my work has been working, you know, on the ground locally here in the mid-Atlantic states and uh, northeast, lower New England, helping um, working lands. So farms, ranch, forest landowners implement farm bill practices for habitat um, installations for pollinators um, and other wildlife as well. I'll still be doing some of that. My position is going to shift a little bit, um, mostly in the range I cover. So instead of partnering with the Mid-Atlantic States at the field office level, I will be working um, come July with the uh, East National uh, Technology Center. And so that's where our regional kind of tech, uh, science and technology team sits. Um, my position will be filled. You won't be left without somebody locally. I'll still be staying here in New Jersey too okay. um, and working remotely, but my, my tasks will change a little bit, um, but I don't think anything that will be too noticeable for, for you guys anyway. Um, I'm really excited to accept some new challenges. Um, the work plan is unfolding as we speak. So there's a little anxiety and excitement as well, um, but it will be very much the same um, advice, giving technical advice and creating tools and documents and, and helping people plan um, their conservation plantings for pollinators. Uh, we also do community projects unrelated to NRCS or the farm bill. Most recently, which Pinelands was our partner on, was our, our habitat kits. Um, so we're looking for ways to really engage, you know, different people beyond just the farms, get the community involved, um, and really expand our partnerships. Because as you all know, you know, this isn't something we can do in a vacuum. Yeah, that's that's all wonderful news. It's so great to hear so many great things from from all of you and and getting to catch up. And it's great that we have all three of you together. Um, and we appreciate you joining us for Pollinator Week because this is a big deal for us and I know it's a big deal for you. And it, kind of following up on something that you said, Kelly, um, about encouraging more people, I, I think we wanted to start off just by asking each of you how you how you celebrate Pollinator Week, maybe both personally and professionally. 
And how can we encourage more people to get involved? We're constantly talking about not just preaching to the choir and making the circle bigger. That's the only way this works to make a difference is to get more and more people involved. So we're just curious how that you're all going to celebrate it and, and some tips of how we can help other people celebrate it that maybe don't even know it's Poly Year Week uh, and how we can get other people involved. And we can start off with whoever wants to start off first. Don't make me it's, pick like it's not a party. Oh. <laughs> All right, Marcus, can you start off first? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the straw man, I guess. No, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> but um, the I spend a lot of time on Pioneer Week just promoting it on social media. You know, and, and, and then in person, there's generally butterfly walks or plant walks, things like that, to try to get people out and about. And so like, I'll either go out on my own I've gotten into butterflies relatively recently, you know, like since 2016, but um, I'll go and conduct a pollard walker, a modified pollard walker, just a, a survey or a, a informal walk with people just to see what's, what's available and what mm -hmm. butterflies are flying and what plants are using things like sort of like what Sam's, Sam's talking about with the, with uh, bumblebees, but it's just getting people out and getting them to notice. You know, I have people tell me all the time, they're like, Oh, you know, I planted, X in my yard because of your post or whatever. And so it's like, you know, a lot of time you feel like you're out there just speaking to the vacuum, right? The voice in the wilderness, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but people do notice, you know, they notice your neuroses and, um, you know, they see that you're passionate and, and that um, there's things that they can do. And so like, I, I spent a lot of time talking about our garden here at the house and you know, we moved in in 2018. Uh, we, we skipped the border on Jersey and we're in New York, but um, you know, we've planted, 100 species of plants, mostly native, um, since that time. And in 2019, just because we're surrounded by more or less, you know, idle land, you know, that's not doesn't have a lot of invasive species issues. We have a little bit of a mugwort problem, but we've got the forest host plants like the oaks and and maples and and hackberry and things in the in the timber. So we had 50 species of butterfly in 2019 in this in this yard. And usually you, you'd be doing good if you get 25 for the whole season, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on where you're, where you're located, urban areas is a little tougher, but it's getting better as people plant and green spaces get um, transitioned into more pollinator habitat. But, you know, that was amazing. I was like, wow, this is great. And then a wrench got thrown in it. We had a late frost in 20 and I had 27 species. And so it, it was really like a, a gut punch, but then you have to realize that these populations are just prone to eruptions and just crashes. Mm -hmm. So, getting people to realize that, you know, yes, they can plant it, build it, they will come sort of a thing, but we have to realize that we need a, a minimum base of habitat out there on the ground that's high quality, to maintain these populations and have connectivity between the patches or else you'll just have species blink out of an area. Um, you know, Harry Zerlin was talking about um, in Westchester County on the surveys that they've been conducting there for, you know, decades, that there are 30 species now that have, they've lost from those counts. Oh. Um, just as development has happened and, and things have changed, things are shifting around, whatever stochasticity there is. Um, so if we don't know what's going on out there, we won't notice the difference until it's too late. Um, and that's a big problem with in monitoring in general, like we've talked about in the past. Like if, if we don't keep tabs on the pulse of what's going on, we're going to be caught uh, unprepared. And we're going to have these continuing listing uh, actions where we don't really know what's going on. Nobody does. Yes. They're just going to say, well, we're going to propose this species. So we need to have some sort of comprehensive monitoring across taxa, not just butterflies, not just bees, but across taxa. But it's tough. You know, we can't even get monitoring on the things that people, quote unquote, enjoy, yeah. let alone some obscure things like, you know, that spend half their life underground like cicadas. You know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, inter life. It, it's interesting you brought up making an impact. And that's something Tom and I talk about all the time. Sometimes you feel like you're talking and, and you don't know if you're making an impact because you're you're spreading the message and you don't get the feedback. And it's mm -hmm. funny because all three of you influence me on a daily basis, but it's not like I'm interacting with you to tell you. So you mm -hmm. don't necessarily know. So it's really hard to, to know just that feedback. I'm hoping with this episode, maybe we'll try to find a way to get some feedback just to know what people are doing to get people yeah. involved. Like, how are you spending your pollinator week? Tell us, you know, have, have any of our guests uh, share something that made a difference with you yeah. or something like that, try to get some. Yeah. And it, another thing that was interesting you brought up is when you put up a post and then people go and plant that plant. And I always love when 
when we put up a picture or profile of a plant on a, mm-hmm. on our Facebook page. And then it seems like the like the most random people that aren't into native plants are like, oh, I want one of those. Where can I get it? And then a lot of times I'm like, well, th- you don't really want this plant. For- you don't want a blackjack oak as your a shade tree in your yard. You you want something else. But um, no, it's it's funny sometimes how effective that is. Just putting up a plant and saying how well, great it is. I was talking to my neighbor and he sees what I'm doing, digging up the lawn like a weirdo, you know, and planting the flowers. Now they don't think I'm quite as crazy. But he's like, I really want some more burning bushes. I'm like, the hell you do? No, no, you don't. Um, you know, so you had to edit that out. But I'm like, I'm just sitting here thinking about killing the ones you've got. Um, and how can I do it without you knowing that I'm doing it? Um, you know, there are some things that are just just so noxious, <laughs> you know, that you just shouldn't shouldn't plan. But you know, we have a 400 year legacy of introduced plants, and you have to pick your battles. Like, you know, am I gonna take out the Rosa Sharon in the front yard? That yeah, it puts up some suckers. But I've got Tartarian honeysuckle back there that I inherited. That that's my priority. I'm gonna try and the mugwort. You know, I'm gonna get rid of that stuff first, the best mm-hmm. as I can, and then I'm gonna get. You know, I'll go down the line <laughs> and yeah. eliminate things over time. Awesome. Replace them. Kelly, how about you? Well, I just want to say, Mark, we got to stop calling ourselves weirdos for digging up our lawns and replacing <laughs> the other people are the weirdos. So, oh, yeah, you should, the conversation is funny. change that perception that it's not weird. <laughs> it's it's the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, when, when Pollinator Week first started, the, the Xerces Society, you know, we would have these big kind of PR campaigns and uh, Facebook blasts and blogs, and we're still doing that. We, we've cut back on it um, a little bit because obviously, you know, we're doing this work year round. Um, <clears throat> and it's a busy, busy time of year for us. You know, this is the busiest time for most of our staff. Um, and so there's, you know, capacity issues sometimes and, and getting habitat on the ground, you know, that, that takes priority. So we're, you know, we continue to focus on that. On June 23rd at, in the evening, we are doing a, um, a Pollinator Week Q&A for our members. So if you wanted to log on to that, um, it's gonna be a little late here because most of the staff involved are on the West Coast. So I gotta stay up late, <laughs> try not to fall asleep. But it's a, a kind of a ask us anything and we'll have representatives from different regions to, you know, get, to dig down deep into those more, you know, region specific questions about plants and, and habitats and uh, the status of certain species. Uh, we'll, we'll be putting out blogs, highlighting certain work, highlighting our partners work. Um, but really for us, this is a way for, you know, one example is, you know, our habitat kit project partners to have a celebration after they've planted. Um, and it's a great way for people to reach out to the community and say, hey, this is what we're doing, you know, whether it's this week or next week, you know, the actual dates of Pollinator Week are, are ambiguous, <laughs> but um, these are ways to get involved. And so it, it creates that nice kind of excuse to get people together and talk about pollinators and what you can do in your community, um, whether it's your backyard or participating in you know, community science program or a bio blitz, or like Marcus said, you know, going out on walks and just observing nature and, and learning how to appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Sam, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to be combining some vacation time with a uh, lecture and trips to the mountains to look for bees with Fish and Wildlife Service and other, um, <clears throat> a mix of always bee activities uh, down in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm. Awesome. Very, very cool. Tom, are you doing anything? Uh, no, not in particular. I think similar to what Kelly said for, for, well, for us every week's plant week, yeah. but it's also almost every week is pollinator week, just because yeah. especially now you're, if you go and see our seed fields, or even some of our, um, our nursery crops here, you see insects all over them. So yeah, we, Agatha and I are actually celebrating it in a different way. We're actually going to remove an invasive tree from our property to make room mm-hmm. for more pollinators. So we're, we're going to remove a, a Norway maple that had been yeah. there and we're going to take that out and we're discussing what we're doing to replace that. So um, we're, I'm excited about that. And when she suggested it, I was like, wow, I didn't even suggest it. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was your suggestion. That's wonderful. So that's kind of how we're, we're going to spend the week. So, so Fran, I'm going to skip the question you have first on this list. Yeah, and because Which I want to save it for later, I, I that's going to be a, a <laughs> actually, yeah, it, it's I actually thought of something too that's not on here. Yeah, I don't know where. What you're... I what I was going to ask is, 
we hear the term pollinator a lot and pollinator really covers a whole bunch of things. Um, is there a best type of pollinator? So I can uh, answer that in, a, in the large way, which is to say that, uh, you know, there are no better and worse, but the, if you look at the environment as a whole, bees are doing most of the heavy lifting, particularly in the east. When you get to the southwest, you start picking up bats that are doing pollination. Um, out west, you have more hummingbird species, and they're doing pollination of plants that lean towards having hummingbirds do that work. And then everywhere you can find some systems that are uh, working off beetles, flies, um, and odds and ends, mixed plants, um, or mixed kind of opportunities. Look at, for example, your pignanthemums. Um, there's wasps all over the place. They're basically saying, everyone who wants a little nectar will be our pollinator friend. That's right. Yeah, I lo love mountain mint. <laughs> it's busy. You know, get, get a good patch of it. It's, it's busy. And, you know, magnolia is like right up in Virginia. That's beetle pollinated. You know, everybody loves magnolia tree. So I thought maybe it would, you know, because we asked all of you to kind of like update us with how you're doing professionally. Maybe we should do it just a quick update on yeah, our pollinators. Like since we talked which, with most of you, it's been a year ago. Um, you know, I know we're always working to help our pollinators, but is there any one um, species that it's in trouble or are we seeing one bounce back as, or are things still the you know, where they were a year ago and we're still just working on that. Is, is there any new new news just on something good or something bad that's happening with the state of our pollinators that we need to know about? Kelly, so I'll, I'll comment that, uh, you know, as Marcus mentioned last year, we had this really nasty spring weather right in the middle of when uh, both the early bloom was out and you had queen bumblebees and a bunch of other species, it just froze out a lot of plants throughout the uh, mid-Atlantic and the Northeast and in the mountains. And then, and then New England went afterwards, went droughty. So it was a really poor year because of that. And what my impression is right now is that things have bounced back. Um, nothing specific um, in terms of individuals, but I'm seeing a lot of, I saw a lot of queen bumblebees this year in the lab and around my yard. So I think, you know, it shows the resilience that uh, these systems have. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's the thing too. It's, it's just sort of like with white nose syndrome and bats, you know, they, the insect eating bats here in the East, you know, when the cave bats got knocked back, the tree bats sort of started to compensate for that population loss. And so like pollinators are that way too. You, if you just look for, or you look for one thing, you look for one taxa, and it might be down a year, but you know maybe you know maybe the the honeybees are down, but then Sam's uh, the bumblebees that Sam were talking about might, or the mining bees might pick up. So it's if we don't keep a tab on everything, we don't really get a whole picture of, of what's going on because things shift around, the composition changes. You know what's what's better, you know richness or diversity. You know uh, mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, what's going on in the landscape, and that's the thing that we get arguing about all the time. You know, would you rather have like, like in your questions that you've sent us, do you want 10 generalists or you know, do you want 10 specialists out mm -hmm. there? I don't know, but like Eastern tail blue butterflies are doing really well. They eat clover in your yard. You know, they're having, they're having a really good year, but everything else, you know, it, it, the diversity is there, but overall numbers are down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, I, I've got 18 species in the yard of butterflies that I've seen right now. You know, I'm hoping that I get past the 27 we had last year. It seems like we will, but it's like one of, you know, I'll see one or two of them, you know, instead of a dozen or more mm -hmm. for their flight period. You know. I think it's, it's really hard to tell just from one year to the other, because there is, you know, like Sam said, and Mark is saying these, this variation year to year and fluctuations in different populations. Um, you know, the, the species that we have a lot of data on, which is few, um, you know, monarchs, bumblebees, mm -hmm you know, things that have been more well studied over the years, um, you know, we're still seeing those downward trends. Um, even though it, in comparison, they might look a little up from last year or the prior year, but, you know, we're not seeing, you know, these gigantic recoveries, um, so right. to speak, in, in some of these species that have been recognized as at risk or in decline. Um, and that's, you know, part of the problem is that there's species out there, lots of them, that we don't know historically what their populations were like. Right. 
um, you know, what their range was like, and, and sometimes, you know, a lot of other things about their biology. So the work that Sam does to do surveys and these citizen science, community science programs are adding to that, but, you know, um, we can't go back, we don't have a time machine, so we can't go back in time, unfortunately, and, and so a lot of times the answer is we don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a great point. We have, you know, we, like Sam and I would say, oh, it's a good year, but it's 40% of what it was 30 years ago. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's a good year for now, but yeah, in the 90s, it was much higher. <laughs> yeah. Mark, Marcus, since Sorry, you focus same. specifically on, on monarchs, I've been seeing a whole bunch of stuff, I guess, on monarchs in the West Coast having yeah. like a serious decline. Like a, a yeah, less than 2,000 individuals, I guess. Is that the same across the country or is it just that population in particular? How are, how are monarchs faring, I guess, specifically to each region and then overall? Well, yeah, it's just like what Kelly's talking about, you know, it, it's it, what we were talking about just a minute ago with how far can you walk into the woods till you're walking out, you know, halfway. Mm -hmm. It's where, where you take a, a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of what's left. Yeah, you know, it's like, so monarchs, they say, oh, they declined 26%. Well, they already declined 90%. <laughs> so it's, you, you, you lost 26% of, for the Eastern population of the remainder, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, we're not, we're not, you know, a half of a half of a half is what we're doing right now. And we're bumping around down toward zero, which nobody wants to be at. Uh, but the Western population, yeah, I think they're just experiencing what Eastern population will experience later. Um, because they have the same threats and there's some genetic exchange. But yeah, the, the Western population that overwinters in California, um, they, they are um, less than 2,000 individuals. Um, and so there's a lot of groups working frantically to, to create more habitat, protect overwintering sites. You know, a lot of people in, in Kelly's organization is Xerxes um, conducting surveys. Um, but it's just like sites that had butterflies and monarchs don't have them now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the overwintering sites, just they just didn't have them. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of concern about that. And in the East, you know, we're planting a lot of habitat, but now we've, I think we've reached a point where there's a huge lag time between, um, when you plant something and when butterflies get there. Um, and monarchs are a lot more, you know, much stronger flyers than a lot of other, than most other species, you know, except for like red admirals and painted ladies. Like most, most species, just like these native bees, the 400 native bees that are around here, um, they're resident. They don't have the luxury of flying across the state line to go somewhere else to get habitat. So I think that they're much more subjected to um, our annual activities and maybe something that's migratory. So we have to keep that in mind too. You know, a lot of these species have very small disjointed ranges as it is, or very specific plant interactions um, that just may not be there. And so that's why I say like frosted elfin and some of these other butterflies are gonna be coming for proposed listings. Um, and if we don't have the data, to say yay or nay, you know, we may get legislated to have them listed. And then, you know, we may not have voluntary conservation measures like we should have, so. For, for pollinators, like we know that the distance that monarchs will travel uh, through their lifespan, but for most of the, the pollinators that aren't migratory, like what kind of ground do they cover? Like what, and I know that's tough to answer. That's a very broad statement, but are most of them local and not moving around? So if you lose that local habitat, it's detrimental. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's classic um, meta population dynamics. So you have a source population that goes and feeds these other little patches, and they kind of pop up and blink out over time ac across the landscape. So if you don't have a base of that, you know, here in the east, early successional habitat, young forest, grassland, um, you know, power line rights away, road rights away, timber harvest, that sort of stuff, um, they just don't recolonize an area. So you create the habitat and they don't get there. They can't make the steps across the landscape. But yeah, the flight distances are pretty well documented for a lot of the skippers, um, especially in the upper Midwest, like Power Sheik Skipperling and, and Dakota Skipper. That, you know, you're talking like 100 yards. You know, if they wow. can't get, you know, between 100 and 300 yards, if they can't get from one patch to another without getting, you know, hit by a car or just missing, you know, they have to know that the habitat's there and they have to hit it when they just go on their trajectory. That's why they fly kind of erratically anyway. But um yeah, to answer your question, I think that um, most of these things are not just resident. I mean, they're very dependent on microclimates, yeah. so, which will help with the ad adaptability as climate changes, too. That they, yeah. Which is a whole other factor that, that I even think yeah. about that we can get into. Sam, you, you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so um, there's kind of two things uh, to think about there when answering that question. One is, um, what's the distance to that they're flying when they've established? And the other is, 
what's the distance they're willing to go when they're dispersing? So I mm -hmm. think more in the bee world. And so a bee wakes up uh, from its long winter slumber or whatever it's doing down there, comes out of the nest, doesn't have an app of where to go. And it will literally do some circles. If there's nothing nearby that meets its criteria for food, it just starts flying. And mm. so there, it turns out that bees are great dispersers. Hmm. So, because they have to, right? If they're like, oh, I give up, I'm gonna just, um, you know, not bother and wait for a plant to grow. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll give you an example. In the Chesapeake Bay, there's a artificial island called Poplar Island mm. that was created as a dread spoil site. It's two miles from the nearest land point um, was created a few years back. We did a survey the entire year, um, not too many points out on that, 200 acres or so, and we found 100 species of bees out there, including three or four species that had never been recorded in the state of Maryland before and were globally rare. So all this points out two things. One is you build it, they will come. So yay for all the planting activities everyone's involved in. And also that um, we don't know very much about anything really. So we can't find these species, yet they still persist, right? It's the fact that we have and find really, really rare species. Well, the previous year, there, those rare species had to exist so that they could procreate and create the um, generation that we found. Right. So it's like having, I always, my analogy is like, what would we know about birds if we had one bird watcher in every state, right? Not that much. Right. So this is where we are with bees and we don't even have names for some of them. Well, what, what I found interesting, when you mentioned Poplar Island, we we have supplied most of the plant material to Poplar Island. We've supplied over over the last 10 years mm -hmm. over million, Mil yeah, millions, millions of plants. Of plants. So now I'm wondering, uh, is it possible that some of those bees ended up there because they came please, from here? Please, it depends on what you gave them. If you gave them what they mostly are looking for, which is probably marsh grasses, yeah, because yeah. these bees... Most bees are not in salt marshes. There's one, uh, Lazy Glossum halophytum, uh, aptly named, but um, the remainder are shy of salt marshes, let's say, but they are fine with the sandy edges. And in this case, most of the action is on either filled comp, uh, impoundments, you know, we're done, it's now regrowing back into something, or these impoundment edges. So it's not even though there might be 200 acres, it's not 200 acres of great stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so it's pretty amazing. And, but it would be like, they have to feed on something, right? Yeah. So depending on what you sent them and what ended up there anyway, um, and what was planted, which is a little murky to me, what was planted on those yeah. berms, um, it all plays together um, in terms of like why you have those bees there. Because if they had no food, they'd be dead. No, yeah. that's, that's true. And we did supply mainly salt marsh plant material and some upland plant material too. But if you think about it, we're not growing it in a salt marsh. It's we're replicating the salt water system, but it's in the middle of a nursery surrounded by mm -hmm. all other material too. Yeah. So it's, but yeah, it's and, interesting to think about. I never thought of the impact of that. that yeah. And I've, I've been to Poplar Island two or three times and never once thought about the, the, insect activity yeah I, I know they talk a lot about the terrapins when you're there i know they say that oh yeah there's deer have swum out and, and gotten on the island right. and you have all the birds and and ducks and all that kind of stuff but i never once thought about insect activity because it is primarily salt marsh and right you, and fish and wildlife, you don't expect to see a lot, yeah, a lot of, it, a lot even of though that was a really interesting to us study and shocking way more than the fact like oh my gosh a deer swam out there <laughs> um, or we have raccoons um, it's, not, you know, I know a lot of people get tours of Papa and they don't mention anything about the bees, which no, is, yeah. I think, the most interesting of the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, and it really shows, I guess, Brian's question, how far some of these things can, can travel. I, I guess when you say bees are really good at dispersal, how far can they go? I know I, I've heard, like, I guess with honeybees that they'll travel from their hive, like two to four miles or something like that. But with some of the native bees, how far can they actually go? So, um, so first of all, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but uh, Poplar Island is two miles from the nearest mm -hmm. landfall. So it has to be at least that yeah. um, in terms of a dispersal. Now, so when you establish a nest, then you ask a different question, which is like, how far are they going to gather pollen? Mm -hmm. So for um, most solitary nesting bees, it's, it's just a few meters, right? Because mm -hmm. they put their nest there because there's food around, so they don't have to go mm -hmm. far. 
Um, but for um, colonial and semi-colonial things like bumblebees are a good example, um, they can fly a couple miles. Um, mostly it's gonna be way less. Like why would you fly a couple miles unless you're desperate? So yeah. most of the time they're um, kicking around in the neighborhood but the dispersing agent is looking for like, oh, this is a good neighborhood. I'm going to settle here. And they may have come in from several miles away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, because what made me start thinking about it was as our forest change, I would imagine that the pollinator population has to change. Mm -hmm. Like if we we're primarily uh, chestnut forests and now there are no chestnuts, then I don't even know if there's historical data of what pollinators mm -hmm. maybe use chestnuts. I don't know. And that's, Mm -hmm. So how has that changed? And we don't even have that information to go back historically to look at. The chestnut is a really interesting story. So most people, um, the literature is half and half in a way. The older literature is like, this is a wind pollinated plant. Um, then you see other people mentioning that there's an insect component. I don't know how established any of that is, but recently to truncate a longer story, we found out that there is a specialist bee that only goes to chestnut. So that would be American chestnut and chinkapin, which is just a small chestnut really. And um, it had, did not wink out. So you can basically go to um, any um, chestnut orchard and um, that we've done so far, we've done a, a bunch or had other people do them and find this chestnut bee, which is Andrina Rennie, if anyone cares about the name. And um, so, uh, which is an amazingly persistent story. So until people actually bothered to look on chinkapin and chestnut recently, there were no records for a good 50 to 80 years because chestnut had disappeared as a major component to the forest system. It also blooms real late. So it's blooming now. It's just basically starting to bloom now, even in the mid Atlantic. And if you imagine it's um, heyday, it was a huge source of pollen and nectar when everything else had stopped in forested environments. So um, yeah, we, we don't know so much about some of these plants. So we're, we're very pro chestnut. Too bad there's still a lot of issues with um, getting them to last for very long. Well, I know there's been some great research being done. So hopefully we're, we're close. So. Yeah. So Sam, you actually sparked a, another question for me and you might know, or Kelly might not even know the answer. Um, when I brought up honeybees and then you said, well, most of the native bees are bringing up or making their nests close to their food, but, but we do see honeybees do travel quite a distance. I know you know, even my house to the closest beehive isn't, it's not very close. The beehives are further away. I know some beekeepers in the area and, uh, it's, Maybe not a mile, but but close mm -hmm. to that. Oh, um, do you want to do you want to pick that up? Or the, yeah. And I I guess the the end of my question would be, uh, are they traveling that far because they can't find food, or there's just so many bees that they need to go and and get it from such a, a vast radius? Or am I just making this all <laughs> up in my head and they actually go that far? <laughs> Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that weigh into that. And, and we see, you know, in, in particular, like working with our cranberry and blueberry farmers here in the state, you know, they, they're basically renting honeybees as an insurance policy for pollination. Um, but they come in and ask for help with habitat because they know, you know, for some of those plants, those crops, you know, our native bees are better pollinators. So they tell me, oh, Kelly, you know, I brought out all of these honeybee hives and the honeybees just flew into the forest. You know, like <laughs> they didn't go to the crop. We don't see them on the blueberries or, you know, they're, they're kind of temperamental. So they, you know, they hunker down until it's nice and sunny. Well, some of our, our species, you know, like bumblebees are more cold tolerant. So if we have a spring blooming crop, the bumbles will be out working. And, and one of the things to keep in mind with a lot of our solitary bees is that, you know, the females are out collecting pollen to provision their nest. Um, and they don't have workers to help them, you know, those solitary um, wild bees are native species. And so they're spending a lot more time on the flower and they're collecting pollen. Um, Whereas honeybees kind of divide and conquer those tasks. So they may send out a lot of nectar foragers 
And sometimes those bees that are foraging for nectar only totally miss the parts of the plant that have pollen. So they're not contacting the anthers. A lot of times they're robbing the plants and they're not spending as much time on the plants because they're going nectar, nectar and, and kind of moving along that way. And so we have these different behaviors um, for these bees that also weigh in on, you know, how they're foraging, how they're visiting flowers, what flowers they're visiting. Um, you know, different species have different uh, lengths of mouth parts. So some really prefer a shallow flower. Some can handle a deeper flower and access those rewards or resources. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into, you know, these patterns of behavior and foraging. Um, you know, at, at one point we thought bigger bees fly further and that's probably a little bit true, but with Sam's work, um, you know, finding bees that are dispersing onto islands, we, we are probably, you know, maybe putting a little too much faith in that statement and, and we are, you know, re-looking at these behaviors and and how far they're going to, to gather resources and food. Wow. I, I, so, it amazes me how much I learned that I don't expect to learn yeah. when we do these episodes. <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Right it's complicated. Yeah. It looks like Sam wants to add. Can I, can I follow up on the honeybee thing? I think people don't realize what heavyweights uh, honeybees are. They're, first of all, they're not native, but they've got a system that doesn't exist in um, any of our native bees, and they can tide over for hard times. That's what they have honey for, right? So they're supporting a good hive will produce about a quarter of a million honeybees throughout the season. So that's why we tell people to be careful. Like if you um, are a honeybee keeper and a aficionado and you love honeybees, all right, you should have honeybees. But if you have a motivation that you're going to uh, put honeybees in parks and your backyard and other places, um, just because you think it's a good thing to do, it actually is not. So you have 250,000 bees that are competing now with all the native bees. Honeybees are not providing pollination services to wild habitats and to even your gardens because the native bees can do all that. So, um, but you've just thrown a bomb into the system, which is all these crazily efficient um, honeybees um, in there. So I tell people like, I get it. You know, you love honeybees, you should do that. And they're, that's what beekeeping clubs are. But if you're helping the environment then you're actually not putting in honeybee hives. Yeah, yeah, beekeeping isn't necessarily conservation. Well, yeah, no, and, and they, yeah, they, you know, people get the idea of like, oh, don't put too many, don't stock too many cows in a pasture. Don't stock too many bees in a pasture. <laughs> you know, what's already there? Yeah. So one, one thing I'll add is, uh, is uh, talking to a blueberry farmer. Kelly, you mentioned the blueberries in New Jersey, which we have some of the best blueberries in the country. Um, but uh, he used to bring in honeybees and then uh, and just noticed the one day, it's kind of similar to what you said, they were flying in the woods or even worse, they were chasing away a lot of the native bees from <laughs> the blueberry plants. And he's like, they aren't even going in the blueberry flower. They're chasing away the bees that were going in the blueberry flowers. And uh, so he actually pulled the plug and said, I'm not going to bring in honeybees. And he found his, and I think I've even brought this up on the podcast before. His, his, yield, his, his yield increased, his <clears throat> blueberries were ready sooner. Um, and yeah. like, there was just more pollination overall by not having the bees there versus having bees there. And blueberries, while there's a lot of cultivated varieties, are derived from uh, native high bush blueberry in our area. So yeah, honeybees have you know they have those kind of bell shaped flowers, and our native bees could hang upside down and get in there. Honeybees have a, have a hard time doing that. I mean, they do visit blueberries, but we've heard this story over and over and over again. Um, you know, and I still talk to some people who are unwilling to give up hive rental, even though they know just in case. You know, it's that it's that you know, what if I do it and have a bad year? And so it's, you know, sometimes pay, and some of these farms are large, you know, they're paying like a salary, oh, yeah. $50,000 <laughs> yeah. a year for, for honeybee rental when, you know, really, um, you know, they can, they can get those bees there other ways and protect them other ways through, you know, managing their insecticide use, through building habitat, just more resilient systems um so 
they have those resident bees on their farm. And there's a lot of weedy bee species that just show up on farms. You know, or we have extreme generalists that that you'll you'll keep finding no matter what. Sam, did you want to add to that? I, I saw at one point you had your hand up. Oh, uh, the uh, Kelly spoke to most of it. The only additional thing is that um, honeybees don't know how to sonicate, which is basically they're shaking um, the flower and certain flowers and and almost all the ericaceous, perhaps all the ericaceous shrubs, which would include cranberry and blueberry, have um, tubular um, uh, pistils, no, stamens. I forget, it's got a particular name. And they have pores and you have to shake the flower and the stamens to get the pollen to come out. Mm -hmm. So some dribbles out and that's what honeybees pick up, but most of them are going after the nectar. So on average, in terms of pollination per visit, um, the natives are far superior because they're doing this buzz sonication to get the pollen out, which of course increases the, the set. And that's what the plant has designed. And um, I do have to say that for uh, working with a bunch of different people doing studies in cranberry that honeybees hate cranberries. Yeah. <laughs> they will do anything they can to not be in there. But yet the um, cranberry farmers are some of the most conservative. It's like they are not going to give up their hives because, you know, it just seems too risky because everything is about that crop. Yeah, and some beekeepers don't even want to drop their bees off on cranberry because, they, you know, there's other more profitable crops as, as far as the bees go. Yeah, they, um, it's a, at the end, the hive is in poor shape because yes. they, um, cranberry provides little for them and they're just exactly. desperate. Well, if I remember correctly. And those structures are, are porocytal anthers. Mm -hmm. the, oh, very the good. Buzz okay. So yeah. if, it, if I remember correctly, they flood the, the, the whole flooding process of the cranberry box was to keep things away from destroying the plants at a certain time of the year, if I remember correctly. Oh, I, I, I oh, can't easy remember. harvest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that affects pollination too and why they're trying to, maybe it chases away native bees when it needs to be. I don't, I don't know. I'm just wondering yeah. if they were doing that to, a, to yeah. help uh, ensure the safety of their plants or they we need our, our, a listener who's a cranberry farmer to yes. call up <laughs> yeah, i always thought they flooded it so the berries came up and then they could harvest them easily. yeah yeah it could Some be a historical of reference yeah. i read where they were flooding I, it to keep things away yeah, from damaging yeah. mm -hmm. but um so for the next question it, it's funny because i want to ask this question but i realize it's a horrible question <laughs> and i'm gonna ask you to do something that i really don't want you to do so because I, I think a lot of times we always look for one solution for everything. And we're like, what's, you know, what thing's going to help everything? But the more I hear all of you talk, I realize there's so many factors at play that, yeah, you may want to put some plants in to help monarch um, along their travels. But then there's so many local specialized bees that you need to support in your area. And, and you need, it's really important to have local plants to support those local communities, like plants that are native, but then you have climate change that's changing the palette of that. And I don't know if there's any one answer, let alone a magic answer, um, but we, we started talking about our yards and what's, what's a great place for our listeners to start if they're looking in their yards and they're worried about pollinators and they wanna make a difference. Uh, where, you know, we always say start small, but what's the best thing our listeners can do to help? And I know it may not be one thing, it may be a series of small things, but it can be overwhelming when you think of all these factors. Is there a good place or, or a, that that's important things to, to start and do? Yeah, so I can answer in a very, again, a very general way is I love the details and these guys love the details too, but don't worry about them. If you're choosing blooming native plants, you're going to be doing 80% of a good job. And if you look for blooming native plants that are blooming throughout the year, you're, you're right in that pocket. And anything you do to reduce your lawn footprint, remember nature, nature doesn't produce lawns, right? So um, you're uh, restoring, uh, rehabilitating and um, giving back to nature what the original landowner, which hopefully wasn't you, um, took away, which is every place that we're uh, sitting in right now was at one point great habitat and is now not because a house is not habitat, driveways are not habitat. And you have options though 
um, not with your house so much as um, with your lawn. So I'm just saying you should feel a little guilty if you have a lot of lawn uh, that you are mowing, mowing nature down. So you can yeah. plant, plant those plants very easily without um, getting into a lot of specific details, or you can really dial in and look at specialist plants and whatnot. Yeah, that was, that was going to be a lot of my answer and probably Marcus's too. Um, you know, and, and one thing we're constantly thinking about is how do we reach all of our audience across all these different landscapes? Um, and, you know, I recently moved from an apartment where I didn't have control of the lawn, right? <laughs> they didn't want me to go out. I would have made some big changes. Um, now I do, and I've been working on my backyard and, and um, reducing the lawn, but some people don't have the ability to do that. And so getting involved in some of our activities, you know, our community science programs, getting out and doing things like um, Bumblebee Watch, helping us collect data, helping us, you know, document um, what species they're seeing, like Sam said, what plants are they on, you know, expanding that database. So hopefully we're all here, <laughs> you know, and it's, 50, 100, 200 years from now, I don't know. But, you know, a lot of the things that we're saying now, we have no data, we don't know, you know, people can, can help us collect that for the future. Um, and it's important for, you know, just to know about our, our general ecology, our biodiversity, you know, the value of nature. <laughs> but also, like Marcus was saying earlier, to, to really influence policy, you know, we can't get species protection if we don't have um, credible and, and um, extensive data on, on the species and their, their population. Yeah we, yeah, we can't even manage, we can't keep common things common, you know, if we don't know what's going on. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to add to what Sam was saying and what Kelly was saying, um, you know, just reducing chemical use in your lawn or your yard. I mean, I've got a mugwort problem and I've been battling it for like three years now, but yeah, I'm getting a little stronger with it maybe than I would like, but, um, you know, there's some problems that have to be tackled that way, but most things don't, most things are personal preference. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or maybe <laughs> laziness. I don't know. I'm lazy, you know, but, um, you know, just, just understand that maybe all these things that might be marketed to homeowners may not be the best and, and definitely think about what you're doing and why. And, and, um, you know, if one pound's good, two pounds isn't better. Uh, for some of these, some of these things, um, you know, follow the label uh, guidelines and restrictions and make sure you're doing things the right way. But I, I, until dealing with this mugwort, I have sprayed nothing in this, mm -hmm. in this yard. Um, I was annoying it with vinegar for a couple of years, um, briefly, but, um, you know, it's, you can get into the mowing timing. You know, we just got through with mo no mow May. Mine's transitioning mm -hmm. into no mow June. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, because it seems to be like a European initiative and we're a little later, you know, they warm up earlier. So I feel like ours should really be no mode June, but, um, you know, it's, yeah, let, let, let there be a little clover in your yard and then, you know, get, get into, you know, maybe not necessarily having it be sod, you know, uh, monoculture, but letting whatever's green there be your yard and whatever, you know, it looks good when it's cut short and then you can kind of not to cut it as often. I mean, I, as much rain as we're getting right now, it's growing again, but, you know, we were mowing like very infrequently, you know, but there are people that mow every three days. You don't need, you don't need to mow like that. You, know? you, and, you bring up a really wonderful point and something that Tom and I talked about a couple episodes ago, there was, I, I had an advertisement in my mailbox for companies that will come out and spray your properties for, for ticks and fleas. Right. Um, you know, and I think it's silly to think that it's only going to whatever they spray is only going to affect ticks and fleas. How how are those types of companies and initiatives hurting our pollinators? Well, I mean, like I had a, a guy, I think when, probably when I first met Tom's dad, I was at a green industry meeting and um, a landscape company owner came up to me and asked about what they could use for ticks that wouldn't affect as many species, you know, and I said, well, they make granular products. So at least you're not spraying a liquid chemical all over, you know, but even that's not ideal. I mean, get some chickens, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, that's what I do. 
and you know, the, it becomes a population sink for the ticks. You know, keep them in the runs; so they don't eat everything else. But you know, they're hard on a garden. But um, you know, the ticks get on a, a chicken. The chicken can reach everywhere on their body um, and eat the ticks. So our we had a lot of ticks when we moved in, and now we have essentially none. Um, but yeah, there's definitely mosquito spraying is probably a bigger culprit. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that we don't talk about. Happens at night. Yeah. You know, yeah, Kelly, Kelly, I look like you wanted to say what? Yeah. Like what does? mosquito spraying what happens when they go and spray for mosquitoes ticks those kind of things you know there's there's i think one of the things is having a little background knowledge for the, the common homeowner to ask questions um what are you spraying with and they often give a trade name and that sure. that's not the great question to ask you know those things change and they're modified but what active ingredient are you spraying mm -hmm. and you know just recently somebody contacted me over an email and said you know people in their development uh, neighborhood are, are having these mosquito spraying services um uh, more than one lawn multiple lawns you know here, here yeah. comes the the lawn service trucks and this individual had inquired about the chemical being used and the, the service straight up told them it was bifen and it doesn't harm bees. And they asked me if it's true. Um, and the active ingredient there is bifenthrin, which is a pyrethroid and it's highly toxic, toxic to bees, bees and many other pollinators. So, you know, um, having these bee safe options is a lot of times great marketing thing to stick on the side of your truck or to put a sign in a yard but oftentimes it's it's really not the case and so having the consumer ask these questions um you know spray aerial spraying for mosquitoes in general is just not effective and it it, it really doesn't make any sense so you know getting rid of that the the source populations the standing water um, if you do have a, a noticeable problem, um, you know, usually it's just a nuisance problem, but treating the, the larval stage of mosquitoes is a much more effective way to do it. Or build up habitat so you get things like amphibians and, and uh, birds and other animals that sure. actually eat them. Um, is, yeah. is I'll, I'll just back that up by saying that any aerial spraying for mosquitoes <clears throat> All of those, there is no safe chemical that's right. killing just the mosquitoes and not the bees. So you can't really allow, because of course they're going to say, oh, well, this is bee safe because that's the answer you want to hear and you don't know anything. You, the homeowner, doesn't know anything. And so it's like, oh, well, now I feel fine. So if you're spraying aerially for mosquitoes, you're buying it from the store, there's all kinds of products that do that. You are messing with the bees. So no is the answer. Yeah. yeah, and we're working with golf courses. When I was working with golf courses, we came up with some best practices for areas that, that are intensively managed, you know, about not spraying during the day when things are, you know, or, or mowing off, say, the clover before you use a, a, an application or something like that. But really, it's, yeah, avoidance, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the out-of-play areas and the native, you know, naturalized areas on the golf course. Like, just don't spray. If you have a woody come up in there, or, you know, or some other resource concern, there's probably a way to address it, especially because they, they tend to have the labor to deal with it. Um, yeah. You know, take a pair of loppers out there and cut the plant rather than spray, you know, they're like, how do I get, how do I get a woody plant out of my milkweed patch? <laughs> like, loppers, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, walk out there and cut it. You know, when, when it comes to our lawns and our gardens, we tend to do without you know you do what you see done but you don't really question it just because you've seen your parents do it or your grandparents do it or your neighbors do it and a lot of these things happen and you don't even realize the damage that you're doing you're just doing it because it's what you've always done or what someone's always done you know and those are mistakes that we've all made you know i'm sure we've all sprayed chemicals at some point without really knowing what the implication was going to be and one of the things um speaking of mistakes that tom and i've been big, big on you know we you make a lot of mistakes but you know, mistakes are good because you learn from them. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about are what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've made that you've learned your most valuable lessons. So I don't know if you have any personal stories or, or stories from people that you work with that that mistakes that have been made that were important mistakes so that you could see someone grow from that or, or, or do better from that. There's always a positive. So. 
<laughs> I'll just mention that uh, our lab, so we're a laboratory um, and uh, we're, we develop, we're, we're kind of a support group for other researchers. And so our MO is to make mistakes. So a lot of it is like, well, how do we count something? How do we develop a trap? How, what plants are the best ones? Well, we're, you know, slogging through tons of plant material, trying all kinds of things. This year we were trying to figure out how do you sample bees and canopies? So we had crossbows that uh, the arrow broke the string or went out to the next country, traps get hung up into trees. It's, it is absolutely what we do, uh, which is uh, trial and error with a, a weighting of the errors. So, I mean, <laughs> that's what your federal tax dollars do, which is allow us to make a lot of mistakes so that we can hand things off to other people so that they don't have to, and we don't have to worry about getting tenure or a lot of other kinds of problematic features of reward. Um, so, yeah, we love we love those kinds of mistakes, and um, we're constantly having to rehash our what we thought was the pattern or what the how bees use plants or how they work in the environment or where they are where they're not. So it's really an important driver for um, everything we do. Awesome, awesome, Marcus Kelly, you have anything? There's something. Come on. Oh, we've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I mean just getting into, you know, when, when pollinators became um, important as, as far as in the farm bill conservation programs, which, you know, I've been working on, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have staff on the ground that knew what to do. So we have been, you know, we've started making seed mixes. We started doing our own research in collaboration, you know, with Rutgers and Penn State on plant selection surveys, um, things like site prep techniques. You know, we, we are, we're basically coming from a world of, you know, people knew how to restore grasslands for birds, but that doesn't always translate into a diverse mix of wildflowers. And so, like Sam, you know, one of the things that that Xerxes, well, I, I'm, I guess, you know, and myself take good pride in is that we do field test the things that we're going to write up and recommend. Um, and something that works great in California, like site prep with solarization, <laughs> you know, doesn't always translate to something, you know, in other regions. So that's why we have our regional guides. Um, we've done trials and across the country. And so we feel, I'm not going to say, you know, that we're giving you the be best recipe that exists. There's, you know, tons of ways to do things and there's different measures of, of success. Um, and a lot of that depends on the resources you have to put into a habitat installation, whether it's what tools you have or labor or money or whatever it may be. Um, you know, but we feel that we've, at least ruled out the things like really, really don't do this <laughs> because we've done this several times in different trials across the country. And, you know, we've had variable results or we had poor results. And when we write a conservation plan or just give anybody friendly advice, we want to make sure we're, we're setting them up for success, yeah. you know, because then mother nature has a role in it that has all of these, <laughs> you know, surprises and, and yeah. things. So we try to narrow down that risk of, of having these habitats fail. And that's, that's been working out for us. Um, and we're still fine tuning things. So in three years from now, the seed mix we think is the best seed mix for an upland dry sandy site might change, you know, more plants might become available. Um, there's all these, these fluctuations in, in um, the year to year and what we learn as we go. We're always learning and the science gets better and, and you get better information over and over and then you keep adjusting. That's part of it. Um, Marcus, you have anything to add on that? Well, I mean, Kelly brings up some good, very mm -hmm. good points and, and Sam too. It's like, you have to learn from, you know, quote unquote mistakes in the trial and error whether you make them or not, you know, learn from other people's mistakes. I like to blame all my mistakes on Pineland's nursery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, no, but seriously, um, you know, it's like Kelly said, it's like you come up with the greatest seed mix ever and it might not rain, you know, or you get a hurricane. Like we lost a site in Florida for Monarchs in the Rough because they literally lost three acres of ground because of the hurricane. Now I'm like, yeah, we can't really count that as a failure. Like that's not your fault, you know? Um, but 
you know, we need, need to um, make sure that we're putting the right plants in the right place and answering people's questions in a way that answers it, but also um, like we've been talking about that lays it out pretty clearly that there are a lot of things we don't know mm -hmm. um, or it can change, you know, Kelly's seed mix work out just fine now, or my seed mix work out just fine right now. And then, well, three years from now, it might not work. So with golf courses, they tried first off before, you know, in the nineties, they tried all annuals. Yeah. You know, looked great. And people were like, they fail. That's because they're all annuals. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And so it's like, how do you incorporate perennials? You know? And then like, you know, like, like I said, sending the right seed to the right place, which can be tricky because seed availability is abysmal in parts of the country, like the Southwest, the extreme Southeast. Um, you just can't, you can't get the mix that you want. You know, common milkweed is, is listed as a noxious plant in Georgia. So we're, we're not going to send common milkweed to Georgia, you know? Um, and so just finding those things out and learning as best you can and adapting um, is, is what we need to do. It's almost, that. it reminds me of that uh, Thomas Edison quote when, when asked about like how many times you failed to make a light bulb. Like, oh, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I found 10,000 ways it didn't work. <laughs> that would be the way it didn't, it didn't work. So. Right. I but, mean, you, you conduct a survey for bees or butterflies or dragonflies. And if they're not there, that's information too. But it seems like a lot of the data is presence absence. Um, and which is, which is hard to deal with in some ways, you know, statistically, but like if you look at what they're seeing in Europe right now, presence absence will throw a wrench in what you're doing because they're seeing these, at least for butterflies, these populations are what they're calling thinning across the landscape. Their geographic range is expanding, but they're lower numbers. And some of that's in response to climate, you know, but, but so you'll have a new butterfly show up in a place and it's like greater diversity is going up, but that population is declining. It's just spreading out. So they're, they're so trying to there. establish somewhere. Yeah, I had a, I had a beautiful transition lined up earlier, and then Fran asked a question and threw us off. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I do want to back up a little bit because we were talking about about honeybees and monarch butterflies, which are two of the more recognized pollinators to just about everybody. You go to a classroom and say, "Hey, what are pollinators?" They're probably gonna say honeybees and monarchs before they say anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and that made me think: Are there pollinators that we don't focus enough on or the pollinators that we focus way too much on um are there any species that come to mind that that we're just spending way too much time thinking about or that we really need to be thinking about a lot more then we take one for the team so we don't throw our gauntlets down and start <laughs> um, you know, i mean the the one that again it's like trying to get people to monitor the the things that are around when we're awake you know or that are cute or we don't mind having around our house you know, th those are key considerations to getting engagement and, and involvement. But to be fair, like there's 725 species of butterfly that regularly occur in North Mexico. Okay. There's 11,000 moths, right? So yeah. moths are getting ignored by a lot of people, but butterflies are flying during the day. Bees are flying during the day. We can see them. So that's, that's my dodgy answer for which one's better, which we, you know, we should be paying attention to moths, but there's so many, you can spend your entire life trying to learn them all. It's hard to tease out what's common, what's a specialist, what composition you should have. Whereas with bees and butterflies, there's a lot more information out there on what the composition might be telling you about the status of whether it's degraded or you know whether there's rare plants there and, and things like mm -hmm. that. that. So that's my answer, you know, because there's all, you, you find a hundred studies, they'll say, you know, like Sam said, bees do the heavy lifting. Well, if you talk about native, Forbes out in the wild, you know, butterflies do pick up some of that, but they don't get credit for it a lot of the time, like flame azaleas, you know, a shrub. Um, there was a recent paper that came out from Nick uh, Haydad and Karen Oberhauser about the secondary pollination of cotton hmm. um, that butterflies are doing. Nobody even thought about that, you know. Um, so it's, you, you find enough to fit your argument either way, but we know that these things are declining um, rapidly. And um, we need to do something about it. And I, and I feel like we can use butterflies and bees, at least in my mind, for a surrogate to know that we'll have the habitat right for a lot of these moths. And we just mm -hmm. won't, you can't tease out 11, you can't survey for 11,000 things. You know, <laughs> the general public can't anyway. And, and yeah, it's just difficult. It's just too many. Yeah. And I think, you know, not, not necessarily a certain pollinator, but I'll talk about it more broadly, you know, a lot of people, when they want to do pollinator habitat, they find the idea of a wildflower meadow very attractive. <laughs> you know, they have this picture in their head that they're like, 
skipping through kind of an <laughs> alpine meadow right, right. growing plants and they're <laughs> blowing in the breeze um, and that's all fine but you know here in forest land a lot of times we're fighting nature to create that meadow um, and on ag lands where it's been kept open for a really long time it, that's a little easier but in some areas it's not and I'm always trying to convince people to think beyond that and plant trees and shrubs that are, you know, not only, I, I think maybe people are like, oh, well, I have trees around or, yeah, that sounds pretty commonplace. I want something fantastic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the amount of flowers on one really good flowering um, shrub or tree is enormous. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times we're thinking about expanding habitat out on our landscape, but there is a lot you can do even in a small space by layering vertically. And I think a lot of times trees and shrubs are left out of the conversation when we talk about, um, you know, uh, enhancing or restoring habitat uh, for pollinators. And a lot of times those meadows, you know, that flowering period in summer and fall, Yes, it attracts a lot of pollinators, but some of them are our most common generalists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking about plants that specialist needs, and a lot of them are tied to, to um, forest understory plants, woodies. And so just expanding the way you think about the habitat that you're building for these, these animals. Nice. Sam, do you have anything you want to add to that? I'll just pack up what Kelly was just talking about, which is uh, we tend to um, go back to the traditional set of plants that are uh, pollinator friendly. And we also tend to, uh, that we can you know buy at the big box stores um, in terms of wildflower seeds or what they call wildflower plants uh, for bees or pollinators. And we tend to be very field oriented. So, um, uh, and what that does is um, good and useful but I would um, just back up what Kelly said and like, it's all about biodiversity. So playing the same things over and over is okay. Just like mm, you can make an argument that bird feeders are okay, but bird feeders are not going to um, really shift the boat of bird conservation one inch. There'll just be more birds, not a bad thing, but now we're evolving in our sophistication to how we support pollinators. And we have to start looking at um, broadening the number of plants available, broadening the plantings that municipalities are gonna be using, broadening the thoughts of homeowners to include some of these more obscure plants that might be supporting bees that only go to that plant. Uh, backyards are not non-habitat for um, these rare and uncommon things, um, but you have to have the plants. So it's, it's the, the movement on a, in a very big way to um, more diversity of plants in pollinator mixes and in our advice and Kelly's group in particular, and I'm sure Marcus is doing it too, are really starting to do that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so we need you to grow a bunch of plants for us. I, 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 we <laughs> need oh, to oh, spice bush. Step up here, pine lands. <laughs> Can we get some fig wart? Uh, <laughs> I will be sending availabilities to all of you as soon as this is over. Uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're talking about helping our pollinators and, and protecting them. And, and when you think of protecting, you know, at, at some point, government has or can step in like there could be legislature like it's something could be endangered species does that kind of help help or is it I, I know this is a loaded question but it's do we need more protection in as far as laws go or does that make things harder in another way to to do these types of things yes <laughs> no. No. You know, and I know it's a loaded question because I'm sure there's pluses and minus there's pluses and minuses to everything that we discuss and I I know that's tough especially for the positions that you're all in yeah but well, um, you know policy on the federal level like endangered species act those kind of policies uh you know they're complicated and they come with a lot of bureaucracy and you know sometimes they're limiting in, in ways that, you know, it's a slow process or it's, it's a capacity issue to 
you know, look at the 200 species that are kind of on the waiting list to be reviewed. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, protection for these animals is important, sure, but, you know, we, we can't sit on our hands and wait for that. Um, sometimes it happens, a lot of times it doesn't, and it's disappointing. Um, but really, you know, shifting that focus to there's policy at all different levels, right? Like down to your homeowners association, like how can you influence your homeowners association to allow you to <laughs> plant other things than, you know, burning bush or, you know, whatever they have out there. Um, how can you influence um, ordinances in your neighborhoods to, you know, allow for, you know, uh, something other than that two inch cut grass that they want to see. Um, how can you influence your community, your township, your parks, um, you know, whether it's at a township or county level to, you know, reevaluate their pest management plans, um, put some policy into action, like we're seeing with, you know, our, our transportation authorities, when they revegetate, now they're supposed to be using a, a high percent percentage of of native species on their infrastructure projects. So it doesn't have to be like a grandioso, you know, national federal policy, um, but you know, the, the combination of the top down um, and bottom up efforts are, are really gonna make some changes. And really there's no better place to start, but, but locally in my opinion. Um, so if you can get your, your groups together and do so, and you know, on our website, we have, we have examples of, of these policies and how to interact with, with your officials in your community. Yeah. Marcus, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I mean, I've, I've gone on the record about like the monarch listing on endangered species. Act. I think maybe we even talked about it. I don't know, but it's, it's recorded, but um, you know, I, I do have concerns about, you know, top down impacting voluntary conservation measures. And as we just saw with uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken, there are ways to sort of get people to act. And if they don't act, there's still a process to have a candidate become listed if the goals aren't being met. So I think there's sort of like this half measure, like Kelly's talking about, like there's, there's an in-between, maybe you get a, a spur to action by at least the feds paying attention to what is going on and then say, all right, let's get a framework in place and deal with it. Like I said earlier, um, we're doing it piecemeal. Like we need some sort of comprehensive invertebrate monitoring um, at, at, you know, the continent level to, to try to address these concerns from the agencies, you know, state, federal, um, as it comes up, um, as they come up, because otherwise we're just gonna be doing this reinventing the wheel every time, you know? I mean, like where we're sitting, there's what, 400, 450 species of native bee, you know, there's, there's 125 species of butterfly. Like, do we wanna do this hundreds of times? Like we need to have our act together um and and basically keep the government out of it like let, give us a chance to make these changes but we have to reach a lot of people and get them involved and sometimes it takes a little spurring um to get people to change but like how do you designate critical habitat for a butterfly that crosses state lines you know the yeah. ag you know it's treated like a migratory bird at that point in um you know the the, the ag sector isn't going to go for that Mm -hmm. So, you know, as much as anybody would want something to be listed, um, anything that's going to impact commodities is going to get a pretty strong look, um, you know, but these resident butterflies or bees, it might be a different game. And we're going to be doing it over and over and over and over as these things decline because we're just, you know, destroying the habitat, supplanting it with something that's not suitable. The, I, there's, you know, with, with doing all of this there's there's always a lot of challenges and it can be frustrating but the reward is high and and we i think in some way or another we've all gotten into the fields that we're in to make a difference and since you've started in doing this with let's just say pollinators do you feel that a change has been made and, and a difference is being made do you see a quantifiable like if you look throughout your career and you could say you know we were here but now we're here you know, we're, we're seeing the, the pendulum swing in our favor. Do you, do you feel that way? Some, some days I do, some days I don't personally, some days I feel like, man, we've made such a difference. We we've done all this. And then I look at something and go, did we, did we make, you know, did it make a difference? 
<laughs> well, I know when I first started and, you know, my, my position is a little complicated, but with my partner position with NRCS, you know, that's essentially contract, you know, um, employee and, and my contract has been renewed, thankfully, several times. So I get to keep working and, and doing this job. But, um, you know, in the very beginning, when I started with Xerces and in this, this partner position in 2013, you know, there was a fear that pollinators were the flavor of the month. You know, yeah. um, you know, after, you know, stories of honeybee declines and all that, and that was getting a lot of attention, native bees started to get more attention. Um, so, you know, we were confident that at least for some time, <laughs> we'd have some work to do. Um, the thing that has really been um, surprising and has kind of quelled those concerns is that every year I, I continue to see more interest. And this is from, you know, the regular folks in my neighborhood to the green team I volunteer for to uh -huh. legislators um, and, and everywhere in between. And so we haven't lost that yet and it continues to gain traction and increase, um, you know, and I think that has been, you know, something that I'm very grateful for because as you know, you know, working on animals, you know, you have fluctuations in what people consider important or what, what needs immediate action. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So from a Perfect. federal point of view and just also tracking a lot of what, what states are doing and other government agencies. Uh, when I started 20 years ago working on bees, um, there was very little um, research going on and there was very little understanding. Then we had the um, colony collapse syndrome um, and what's uh, just again, mirroring Kelly, it's been a steady march towards more and more interest and more and more research and more and more understanding by homeowners and the average person. Whereas at the beginning it was just, you know, crickets. Um, and then I have to say that uh, with the turn of the new administration, it's exploded in the fe the federal level. So it's not necessarily very apparent to anyone else, but oh my God, so many meetings and people wanting to devote resources now to the uh, pollinator work. It's really heartening. So I'd say a hugely, hugely popular. And also people are getting more sophisticated. I mean, just look at your guys' uh, business and um, what you are doing now for uh, pollinator plants and talk, how you talk about that and how you did, you know, again, 20 years ago, very different. You probably didn't even talk about it. You maybe you had butterfly no, bush. No, we, we, we didn't. And it's, you know, it's a whole different shift on how it's approached. And, and that means that we're more educated and our customers are more educated too. There's more of a demand for that, which is great to see. Um, you know, and it, it's it's funny. It, it sometimes it's how you choose to view the information too. Like on our uh, Facebook page, um, we're talking about something, and someone mentioned, "Oh, I've never heard of a rain garden before." Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, almost a little sad because I was like, "Wow, that's something that you know I know personally. We've been working to promote for for 15 years, mm -hmm. and here's someone locally that still doesn't know what it is." And I'm like, but on the plus side. This is someone that's now interested that we're converting that we're able to make the circle bigger and it's one more, one more piece in that conglomerate <laughs> that we're able to to educate. So I was kind of like sad a little bit and actually a little happy once I I took a second to brush that sadness off. So, um, you know, and it's it it does like how we approach things have changed like the uh, not just the marketing just how we feel about it. What you know you learn what you have. And, and all the good that it does. It's not just planting a native plant because it should be, you're planting it something where it should be. It's all the other aspects of the ecosystem that you're bringing to it. It's not just the plant, it's it's the whole picture. And that's that's a beautiful thing to see. Marcus, yeah, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, the, appreciate it. The thing, a, a good example is just look through the transition over the last five or so years of plant milkweed to, 25 things <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it's 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 shifted you know people people are gardening and and doing restorations they're planting a much more diverse mix than they were initially i mean the, obviously for monarchs planting milkweed is, is pretty important um and other species do nectar at it but there's been a transition i think you know and we did with monarchs and rough like i came in and the concept was we're going to send milkweed seeds everywhere i'm like and 30 other things you know <laughs> um so it's, you know we need a more diverse mix we need to have a full bloom get the shoulders of the season blah blah blah. you know 
how many pollinators can we possibly support? How many different shapes of flowers and colors? And, you know, and in, so that the milkweed transition is, you know, from just milkweed to more things has been across the board, but, you know, with golf courses, with, with Monarchs in the Rough, we've seen just people enthusiastically adopting superintendents, just being so excited about using native plants in their broader landscape that it's just, we essentially touched off this explosion of um, people just taking it under their own initiative. They may not have even signed up for Monarchs in the Rough, but they're uh, like, I talked to this one superintendent in New Hampshire. He's like, you know, I know we aren't your, your, your zone for the grant money at that time, you know, and he, and he was like, but I'm going to convert 12 acres. I'm like, restore 12 acres, but still, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, let's, yeah. let's do that. You know? Um, so it's how you think about it, but you know, they're, they're doing it on their own. So we had 755 golf courses by the time that I left. We didn't know if we'd get the first hundred. We're sitting around going, we got this grant money. Do you think we'll be able to spend it? I don't know. You know, and so we started talking to people and like, we're giving things away for free. Will they take it? And they already, someone had a bad taste in their mouth from that all annual thing that I had to overcome uh, that predated any of us. And um, there's, it's just this, it's, it's this ripple effect going out. People are trying it. They're seeing their peers try it. And that's what we need in the residential area too. You know, there's 40 million acres of residential lawn. We don't really need that much, you know, you know bad bitten doesn't take up that, that much room. Um, <laughs> so, you know, how, how can we get people to, to start thinking about things holistically and, and, you know, like cutting down the lawn, like Sam was talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, the advice, a lot of the times when Tom and, Tom and I are asked, you know, what's the best place to start? You know, one thing that we always advocate for is just, we always preach making the circle bigger. A lot of the times we're talking to people that already know the benefits that we're right. all talking about. It's, but how can you help not convert, but bring someone else in? Because so many of these groups and, and so many attitudes I see, it's almost like an elitist attitude from, not from the professionals, more from, I don't want to say listeners, but a lot of the people involved that you know, it's when, when people try to come in, they, they get scoffed at, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and it's just, um, a lot of times when we get asked to talk, we're talking to the choir. So it's yeah, like, it's how people do you, already interested in, yeah. in native plants? They know a lot of times we're talking to people who know more than we do. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, to... <laughs> yeah, we're all sitting here critiquing each other, yeah. but yeah. And, and, and th there's a lot of truth then. So I, I sit around and think about like what sector or group hasn't been talked to or hasn't been engaged. Mm -hmm. And that's where golf courses came about. Cause you know, I'm, I'm working on it now with Sustainable Monarch, you know, creating this network of butterfly reserves that are managed specifically into the future. But I've had this idea for six years and it was always, how do we buy the land? You can't afford to buy the land. And then Audubon International is like, we work with golf courses. I'm like, sweet, I don't have to buy the land. Um, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you try to you try to adapt what you want to do to fit the situation. Um, but there's definitely an opportunity to reach out to other stakeholders that may own land that maybe hasn't been addressed. And like, you know, Xerxes has started to do some of this work uh, in particular with um, uh, women landowners, you know, Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever, they're starting to do it now too, because they're the largest growing sector of farmers and landowners, you know? Um, and so female farmers and ranchers are being talked to more now than they were five or 10 years ago. And so it's things like that, or golf courses or civics organizations, you know, like, um, who manages that town green space, you know, and, and how do you talk to, you know, the Kiwanis Club, the Lions, Rotary, you know, whoever. Yeah. And, you know, Rotary has a big um, initiative right now. They're calling Operation Pollination. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, that's very close to Operation Pollinator Syngenta has, but we'll go with it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's building awareness and getting the clubs, the volunteer base to do something at home or they're all business owners, you know, in Rotary at least. You know, they're movers and shakers in the community. They control what happened, what planting is like in front of the country club or the pool or the bank, you know, restaurants. You know, you know, how, how do we get these movers and shakers to start implementing these things? And then the people will follow suit. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's how do you make people care? People care about a lot of things, but how do you make them specifically care about this? And sometimes you're not even aware that they may not, they're ambivalent to it. It's, I was kind of surprised the other day that our, our local high school, uh, which Tom went to, my kids, mm -hmm. my kids went to uh, contact me and said, you know, we've never actually bought plants from you. Like, and we mm -hmm. have an incredible ag program at that school. And they're like, we just realized you're not set up in our system. We've never actually bought plants. We've donated plants and mm -hmm. we've worked and we've talked, but it was just, it's kind of surprising to me. It's like, 
how did how did I miss that? Like, how did I miss that? You know, we could be making a difference with kids at that age yeah. um, mm-hmm. when they're most impressionable to make a difference. And I missed that opportunity. And I never even thought about it until they reached out to me. Well, so I, I, I struggle with that too. You know, I'm worried about what's going on in California or Texas or whatever. And yeah, I could be doing a project with the local school, yeah. you know, then I've been thinking about trying try, ways to implement that, but it may be, end up being out of my own pocket or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's hard to do stuff locally when you get distracted by everything else, you know, I deal with my yard, but you know, I need to do a better job of promoting pollinators here locally. You know, cause I, I look at where my kids are and how I was brought up and how they're a lot more tolerant of things than at the, the era that I was growing up in mm. and, you know, things have changed. And if you can make a change at that level, when they're impressionable, you know, just imagine where we could be 30 years from now with just mm-hmm. what they're thinking of things like pollinators and, and native plants and that, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's trying to think outside the box. And that's one way that we're like, what's an out of the box way to do it. And that maybe that's a good place to start. Have you, are there any out of, out of the box ways that you've come across that, that you're like, you know, typically we hadn't focused on this, but this may be a good idea to, to reach more people or make people care. So I can tell you, um, <clears throat> we do these really high um, definition, intense photographs when mostly they were done for scientific reasons um, to create an online museum, let's call it, of all kinds of rare species. But we also made them very beautiful just to satisfy ourselves. Cause like, if we're gonna spend all this time, <laughs> I, I wanna look at something nice. And they are right. beautiful. Yeah, and so, um, but the, the uh, interesting thing is that um, uh, lots of people like, like, it turns out, like looking at them, it's a longer story, but we have a huge following with, um, you know, millions and millions and millions of views and we make the, the um, downloads available. And then we, because all of a sudden we realize, oh, it's the general, general public that's looking at this, not the people in the choir. Yeah. Um, we then have a platform to speak to. So we also tell stories and we don't do it in, you know, our traditional super dry, boring way. <laughs> we'll tell funny stories about um, what's going on um, with how that bee was captured or what the backstory is or story about ourselves or the uh, other people. And we have lots of engagement that way. So that's really been for us, you know, we're a very boring scientific lab. Um, we have now the largest following in USGS, which is 8,000 employees and more than the volcano people, for example, <laughs> uh, which is a lot. It arrived. <laughs> so wow. um, it, can, it can be done and our hook in this were those pictures, which are, by the way, public domain. You could just take them and say that they were yours, right? And then you could have this following too. But um, uh, anyway, I offer that as a example of these, these odd ways, because now we've got a big uh, reach into a groups of people who you know, could care less about mm-hmm. my scientific publications. Mm-hmm. Wow. If we could find a way to tie in native plants to Sasquatch, we would have, <laughs> yeah. when we look at the podcast charts, it's like the first five are always about Bigfoot. You know, if we could, apparently there's, there's a large following for that. If we could tie that in, we'd be golden. <laughs> we could reach everyone. No, that's not. And those pictures are, are fabulous. Yeah. And they, they capture my attention every time I'm going through like a Facebook feed and they, I always find myself drawn mm-hmm. to that. And that's a great, great example. Yeah. Anybody else? No, no. Kelly, I don't know if Kelly wants to. Say. I mean, that's that's what we would like to do with this butterflying world series. Is just get more people noticing, going out. And even if you don't know what the butterfly is, we can figure out a way to capture that that data and use it in some way. You know, just just that you saw a butterfly, and we can probably figure out what it is based on the time of year. So, but that's why I set it up with. Um, the number of species you see or the total individual number of butterflies because you, you may not know what it was and maybe you're learning you know, so it's trying to appeal all experience levels and all backgrounds to try to be more inclusive mm-hmm. um to get people out and contributing to these databases in this case e-butterfly or iNaturalist but um so there's something for everybody whatever platform you like to use but just getting people to notice what's out there start keeping track and then hopefully transitioning into doing some action like 
planting a garden um, and that sort of thing. Awesome. Yeah. yeah with, with the Butterfly World Series, I think we're going to have to put that in our, or challenge our listeners and, and maybe put a little prize at the end in oh, our I Facebook like group. I like so that. maybe who will we'll have some, some themes in our group and then uh, whoever gets the most. I don't know what they'll win. Who wins? Maybe, oh, maybe, maybe they'll win one of our new t-shirts. Uh, one of our new t-shirts. I think that's, that's a great, great idea. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Tom, did you have any any more questions? I know we've been. No, no. I think we're we're at a good place right now. Um, I'm sure we could go. We, we could keep <laughs> going an hour on. And a half, but I think we're in a good spot to, to kind of wrap it up there. All right. Awesome. So, you know, and I know you've all done this before and we, we kind of always end with what's your favorite native plant, but since it's pollinator week, we can just kind of specialize a little bit more. What's your favorite plant for pollinators? And it could be anything you want. Uh, I'm going to go from left to right on my screen. So Kelly, you can go first. Well, my favorite is, and I hope this is what I've said at my favorite was last time too. So I can remain consistent. <laughs> We're going to go back but and check. <laughs> what I said. I absolutely love uh, pussy willow solace this color for the early spring bees and many other reasons. It gets me excited about the spring. You know, awesome. there are specialists on it. It's it's um, a plant that I think doesn't get enough attention. It's super easy to plant and grow, and so um, you know, I get I get very excited um, searching my neighborhood. You know, I live here in New Jersey by Cooper River, so I'm always creeping around there early spring, looking at the willows and, and taking pictures of bees. Awesome. That's a great one. Sam, how about you? I'm going to say um, uh, figwort. And um, it's not a plant that you would maybe necessarily plant just for bloom presentation. Yeah. But oh my gosh, it's producing buckets of nectar on a whole series of little tiny flowers that are up reasonably high, you know, like um, towards uh, waist high. So, and then the bees are out in the open. Um, accessing those little tiny flowers. And so it's like a little bee circus. So you get a lot of action, a visibility, you know, it's something to sit around and, you know, have in front of your front porch and just watch what's going on. So um, that's my favorite right now. Awesome. That's great. How about you, Marcus? I think I had to say prickly ash. It's a good, good one not to hug, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, the, it's the caterpillar food plant for giant swallowtail. So I like I like when I see those here along the Delaware River. It's where the range comes up, you know, the northern extent here, and we get some giant swallowtails here in the yard because of it. And I, I say I'd love to see that plant more available in the nursery uh, realm. You take just like plant in the corner. Yeah. You don't plan on running. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and and like we do every podcast, we kind of end this with a final thought for everyone. Where. Um, we just give you the floor for, for a minute or two. Uh, you can summarize, you can promote something, you can um, use the time however you want. And Kelly, we're gonna start with you again. Well, I just wanna thank everybody for listening and um, you know, keep doing good work, keep fighting the good fight, promoting pollinators, finding new ways to get involved. Um, like I said, it doesn't just have to be, you know, getting a bulldozer and taking your lawn out, although we would probably uh, be supportive of that. <laughs> but these other ways that you can get involved with your community, um, whether it's through our community science programs or community engagement um, programs like Bee City and Bee Campus, there's, there's tons of ways to get involved. And, you know, a lot of times when I give presentations, because I, I typically work on larger habitat installations, People see those pictures, although I've been getting more small, small scale garden style pictures into those. Um, they think that these efforts are beyond them, that they're unachievable, that they can't do it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I want people to not think that because bees, you know, you could, the insects in general, you know, they're readily accessible um, <laughs> to a large swath of people across our landscape. And so, you know, we can participate in pollinator conservation in small and large spaces. And there's animals we just can't do that for, right? Yeah. Um, so go out there, notice what's around you, enjoy nature and, and the intrin intrinsic value it brings to you every day, whether it's looking at pollinators or beyond. Awesome, awesome, that's fantastic. How about you, Sam? 
I, you know, I, I have almost always a very simple message that hits almost everyone, um, except maybe apartment dwellers, which is reduce your lawn. Like it's a very simple give back. And because bees are tiny, um, you can, like Doug Ptolemy uh, presents, you can really have a entire national park, refuge, whatever in your backyard, but not if it's just grass. Awesome. That's fantastic. How about you, Marcus? Yeah, I, I want to echo what's been said, but you know, plant, plant a garden, encourage your community spaces to add native plants where they can, and and you know, work on that at the larger landscape level. Um, you know, as far as a plug, check out sustainablemonarch.org and see what we're doing with the economic incentives. You know, we're, we're paying a dollar a pound for mature milkweed pods. If somebody wants to have their whole community collect milkweed, um, and the, the products are made. You know, clothing, lotions, blankets, you know, there's a whole slew of things that'll help build an economy based on native plants, in addition to buying and selling the seed and, and the ecological benefits that we all know about. Um, you know, it can be a, a significant income uh, addition for local people that might be underemployed, um, but definitely an opportunity for entrepreneurs to make things, make products out of these uh, plants and help promote them in everyday use and reconnect people to the land. Awesome. That's fantastic. Brian, why don't you go? Sure, sure. So I know uh, for some of our listeners and and for me as well, sometimes these talks can be overwhelming um, and it's a lot of information and it, you know, sometimes it can even be a little scary. You start thinking about, you start stringing these podcasts together, together and you, you think of all these issues, like it's it's our water, it's our soil, it's our pollinators, it's, it's everything. And it can be overwhelming and you don't know where to start. Um, a lot of these organizations you can be a part of and, and be part of a great uh, community and, and make a difference that way. But also remember, restoration starts at home. Plant one native plant and enjoy it. And if you do that, you're doing more good than you realize. Start with one plant, enjoy it. Like do the hard work, enjoy why it's there, see what happens from there and build. It's, it's, you can take it one step at a time and, and it doesn't have to be large, it can be small. Awesome. Perfect. Thank so uh, basically mine was... Um, I didn't steal yours, did I? No, All no, right. no. <laughs> it's... Uh, what, well, I guess it kind of was. So I'm going to change it a little bit. But basically what Fran said, there's all these different issues. You listen to the whole string podcast. There's issues that go in every single direction, but they all kind of revolve around one thing, and that's including more native plants. Um, and we're lucky at Planet's Nursery to work with so many of these great organizations. That's why we started the podcast to highlight some of these organizations because they're doing so many great things and people can really find their, their niche. One way that you're going to be able to support some of these organizations, see what I'm, I'm oh, tying I, all together. I like here. where you're going. <laughs> so, um, yeah, one way you're able to support all these organizations is by buying one of these t shirts that we just have uh, just created and they launched last week. Uh, each we haven't figured out how we're going to divvy up the money, but we're going to try and uh, take basically all the profits that we're making off these shirts. We're not keeping them. We don't need it. We want to give it to these organizations because they're doing such amazing things. And, uh, and that's where we want this to go. So we still haven't figured out how it's all going to break down. Hopefully it's not like 50 bucks that we're splitting up between all these organizations. Hopefully it's a little bit more substantial than that, but um but that would be my my final thought. We put up uh we made some creative designs, so we hope you like them. I'm excited yeah. about them. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm gonna wear the, them yeah, we'll get the links, share them around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, it's, I I love that we're we're being able to give back and also doing something that yeah this that is we, we the big enjoy. thing is making that circle bigger. This is one way to do it. If you go to a Wild Ones conference or, or this is what we we're talking about, Kelly or with Kelly earlier, you go to a wild ones conference or you go to your native plant society, you're going to even just a garden club meeting and you're wearing a shirt that says plant native plants or native plants, healthy planet on it. That's going to send a message. And then hopefully it drives more people uh, to, to learn more about that message, either whether it's through us or through other means. You know, even better if you're, if you're not at one of those places and you're just at the park and a random person yeah. comes up and sees and yeah. says, where did you get that? How can I be a part of that? If you can convert someone that way, that's, that's a wonderful thing as yeah. well. So, so we've been working hard on, we're excited for you guys to see well, them and hopefully you've been wearing them. Hard on. Yeah. I, haven't, yeah. I haven't done anything. Bring me one idea. <laughs> and, I've done I had one, and it wasn't even that big of an idea. Well, so that is it. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to our rooted discussion. For more information, visit Native Plants Healthy Planet uh, website for links. 
Um, thank you, everyone, listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pinelands Nursery. We're going to give a huge thank you to RJ Comer for contributing our theme music to Rooted Discussions and as well as our Buzz episodes. He does as well. Uh, make sure you listen or download RJ's music at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube uh, at our custom URL, Pinelands Nursery. Uh, don't forget about the question and comment line, and and it's nice that you haven't because we have gotten some some uh, new callers on that. Uh, call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that, 215-346-6189. Ask a question, leave a comment. When we play your question and comment, uh, we'll comment on, on it ourselves on a future episode of The Buzz. And uh, let's keep that Native Plant Healthy Planet Facebook group growing. Man, it's just – it's. It's getting to the point where it's taken off. Like early on, you get one or two here, but now it's like every time I look, it's like 10 or 20. Oh, yeah. People. Yeah. And a lot of good discussions happen over there. Yeah, so, totally, totally. As always, you can listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. Uh, as I'd like to say, I don't know how many people who are doing that. Even Russ Benari, who had listened switched. on the website for so long, he converted. Our, our former guest and friend, Russ Benari, he switched and he's listening <laughs> through a different method now. Yeah. So you're probably listening through Apple Pod. Of Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, really wherever you consume your podcast. So with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone, for listening. I'd like to thank all of our guests again. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us today. Uh, coming up next, we have a buzz episode We have of Undetermined Topic. Uh, I guess we'll figure it out probably the, the day before or yeah. the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's starting to you know, we're still busy, but we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So we'll, we'll start being better prepared as we get closer. But uh, we'll have that coming to you next week. Until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.